Hi, everyone. Good morning, fellow hoarders. I'm sorry, fellow collectors. In the interest of time, I've cut some things down a little bit, and, and we'll try to keep it. Get us a little bit closer back on, on schedule, uh, so bear with me. Um, the challenge under discussion for the next hour, so much art but too little space, is one I believe most of us have faced. But usually the problem has not stopped us from buying still more. To get us underway, I want to acknowledge the very wise person who thought and organized this panel, Scott Chase. Scott, I think you're somewhere up here. Everybody let Scott know. Of course, as always, if you enjoy the panel, it's really all my doing. If you weren't happy with it, blame Scott, OK? Um, and if you don't know, Scott is based in Dallas, and he has been ranked as a super lawyer and a best lawyer, which tells me that he was smart enough not to take on the moderator role for such a challenging and potentially sensitive discussion. Very smart, Scott. So here's the framework we've agreed to as a team. I will briefly introduce the panelists all at once. Then they each will speak for about eight to 10 minutes. I will keep them on schedule by whatever means necessary. I have things that might beep. I have a card that says two minutes. So we're gonna do our best. I know it's hard when, when you're talking about things you love. First to speak will be Sue Canterbury, Associate Curator of American Art at the Dallas Museum of Art. The DNA was smart enough to steal her from a similar, similar role at the Minneapolis Museum of Art. She also served as assistant curator at the Williams College Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts. As all of you know, Sue has organized many, many important exhibitions. Perhaps um, the one most dear to our hearts, um, her 2014 exhibition on Alexander Hoag's Erosion Series. Today, Sue will be answering the question, what is the collector to do with all that art, with advice for making loans, or gifts to art museums. Next, Andrea Perez, um, next to Sue, is an attorney specializing in art law, intellectual property, and business law in Dallas. She's also an adjunct professor at the Meadows School of Art, where she teaches a course on international law and the arts. Scott, you'd better watch out, because this year she was named one of Dallas's top lawyers under 40, so she's coming. That's why you recruited, okay. And Andrea's topic will expand on Sue's discussion by reviewing other ways we can sell, donate, or lend our um, endless number of objects. And, and she importantly, from a lawyer's perspective, will address some of the legal concerns we really need to be aware of. Um, then the amazing Ted Lusher will offer the important perspective of a collector extraordinaire to the conversation. Ted and Sharon, his collecting partner and wife, have been seriously collecting for over three decades. Is it four or three? Somewhere in there. Their collection is comprised of objects associated with the southwestern U.S. and northern Mexico, also known as the Borderlands region. Ted estimates their collection counting every book, artifact, and work of art, currently totals about 12,000 objects. So Sue, let's get started, shall we? And um, we'll go from there. Good morning, good morning. I think I'll hold it with my left because I talk with my right hand, so. Um, Great to be here, and I'll be quick so I don't get a piece of duct tape slapped over my mouth uh, at 10. But basically, I'm almost here, almost in this sort of quasi, almost medical role, um, because I'm here to suggest a treatment, um, a treatment for the condition of collectionitis, which is brought on by uh, an addiction, an ad addictive uh, compulsion to acquire things, which leads to too much art for too little space. And so there's no real cure for the addiction itself, um, but there are actions that can be taken to resolve the pressure of congestion 
in uh, the, your immediate environment. Now the most severe and probably the most expensive is you can go establish your own museum. You know, um, that might be beyond the bandwidth for most of us, but you know, for those you know, who want to, that's an option. Uh, the other thing is you can also um, think of lesser measures. These are more Band-Aid measures, which are along the lines of lending your works uh, to various museums, uh, particularly in the uh, context of lending them uh, so the curator there can use them to supplement weaknesses in their own, uh, own collection. So they're there on an extended sort of uh, um, basis. Uh, for you know, a year, a couple of years, three years, uh, and that can help the museum to represent areas in which they have weaknesses. There's always the exhibition option, and you know that may be you know lending your things to the various um, you know exhibitions, but they always come home, you know, and so you still have this uh, overflow, and meanwhile you're continuing to acquire things, I'm sure, and so those don't really resolve the situation, and then you could yes, you could have a an exhibition of your own collection, and even that always comes home to roost as well. And, and I should warn you that these days, many museums um, now have requirements that they do a uh, exhibition of a private collection. It comes with a requirement of a gift of a portion of the collection. Uh, and basically that's because many museums in the past, they've done exhibitions of collections, and they do these exhibitions because they want you to give your collection. But, and if they create a catalog, it serves as a great sales catalog. And so after the, so after the exhibition is over, suddenly you know, next, the uh, museum might find a lot of things going to market and things that they were hoping to have. And I think also you know, if a curator is interested in borrowing uh, you know, one or two of your works to display, part of the reason they do that is because they know they have a weakness in the collection. Um, of that particular artist, um, or maybe women artists, uh, whatever, and they're hoping that once you see it on the wall at the museum, you know, it'll be like a gateway drug. You know, they'll, they'll pull you in, and then you'll think, well, it looks so good there, I think I'll give it to the museum, you know, and so that's part of the thing. So, you know, take that as a clue, even if they don't come right out and ask you, could we have that, would you give that to us? They're really saying that's a really great work. We admire it, and they're hoping that you know you'll get the hint sometimes. You know, so for those of us who are more subtle and just don't come right out and ask for things like that, so those are the some of the band-aid measures. Uh, and in that case, you need to work with the curator of the museum um, because they need to know what you have, and they know the weaknesses within their own collection. Um, and so that's one thing, but you know, then there are other aspects. Um, you know, you have a lot of work. Let's say, you know, you've been working on your collection, you know, for a good portion of your life, and a collection is never finished. You're constantly refining it. I mean, how many of you have sold something? Early acquisition, it wasn't the best, and you sold it to get something better. Could you raise your hand? Okay. All right, so you know that it's, it's a process. You know, the care, the whole thing is a part of this very large process. But eventually, you know, there's gonna come a time when, you know, you, the greater part of your years are behind you. And you have to start thinking ahead about what are you gonna do with your collection itself. And so you consider your options. You know, so if you're not starting your own museum, and even that will eventually be turned over to somebody else who could do something you didn't like, but um, do you leave it to your children? You know, what if your children are not interested in art at all? Or they're not interested in your particular type of art? Do you liquidate it and just give them proceeds? You know, so you know, those are you know, questions about it, or do you give away part of it and liquidate part of it? Um, another thing is, what if you don't have any children? And you're in luck because museums are always happy to work with childless couples. So, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I have to say as a consideration, oh, they don't have any kids. You know, but, um, and then the, you know, the other thing is, is that do you, you know, leave it or a portion of it to the museum? And that, this brings me to something that's called legacy. What will your leg legacy be? What do you want your legacy to be? Um, 
Do you want to enhance the life of your community through sharing these works with the public through the museum of your choice? If such is your desire, what are the ways in which you can ensure that the future disposition of your collection is done in a manner that would be agreeable to you? And here's how you plan ahead before you're dead, okay? So first, before you do anything, if you're thinking towards gifting, for instance, uh, to a museum, you need to work with the museum curator to find out what the museum's needs are, what their weaknesses are, where works in your collection can step in and raise the bar of equality within the museum. Um, the, mu the curators are going to know their collection, and as they get to know your collection, they'll see where the two coincide together. I mean, presently, uh, I've been working with a couple who they have a really great collection, and they call the curators in, and we decided what are the things that, you know, we have things by the artists from this and this period of their life, but not from this particular area or this particular series. You know, we know those things, and we've created a list, and so they'll be able to do estate planning later on. And so they're working directly with us, you know, way before, you know, their demise, you know. So there's something, you know, to uh, be considered in that. And, you know, sometimes your collection is going to contain superior examples to what we have, you know. And so those would be uh, works that would be shown rather than our works if, you know, your work is superior. So those are, you know, some of the things to think about. And, you know, if you're thinking about giving your collection, I say please, please don't do the ultimatum of take it at all or nothing. Um, museum storage spaces are bursting at the seams. I don't know if any, many of you saw the New York Times article recently that came out about how these museum collections are growing exponentially to the point that they're paying incredible sums to build off-site storage, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's a really big predicament to be in. Oh, I've got two minutes, oh dear. And so, you know, there is, so there's, there's a situation and so please don't, but again, work with the curators. And so the things are, you know, what are your options in giving? The outright gift, the bargain sale, promised gifts, fractional gifts, and restricted gifts. Outright gift is exactly what it says. Here, I'm giving this to you, you know, your, 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 your name's on the credit line, and that's basically it. It's giving the museum full freedom um, to, you know, move forward. Bargain sales, you agree with the museum to transfer basically part of a painting's value, basically they, they, the museum purchased part of it and the other part of the fair market value is taken as a tax, de tax deduction. Now, I've even worked in a deal when I was in Minneapolis where it was like an annuity was given to someone for several years until her death because she wanted her father's painting in there so badly. Uh, and so there are all sorts of things that could be done. Promise gifts and bequests, promise gifts, you know, during your lifetime you say, I'm going to give this to the museum, you do a formal letter, but it is not a binding document. Your children will feel bound to give, you know, uh, according to it. And that's why museums will ask that uh, essentially these people put it into their wills, so their wishes are um, respected. And then fractional gifts, which are really more of a tax sort of dodge. Um, it's a replacement for the old uh, gift with life insurance interest. You used to give it to the museum, but you kept living with it until your death. Now you can give a fractional gift, uh, you get a tax break, but the museum takes possession immediately. So, but you have to complete it within 10 years or your death. Uh, and then finally, restricted um, or unrestricted gifts. Now, outright unrestricted gift is what's preferable to museums because it gives them freedom and leeway. Um, not only you know the collection, but also in the exhibition of it. Um, but the other thing is the restricted gift that it comes with requirements. And let's say a collector might say it can never be lent to an exhibition, or it must always be on view, or third, it must have its own gallery space, uh, which basically it's exclusively for their collection, but it removes it from the greater context, you know, of the other Texas works. You know, and so again, it, it creates a disjunctive sort of experience with the museum, or then the one never can be sold, uh, which is also not good because as all of you 
have in the building of your collection refined it by sometimes selling up. Sometimes a museum does similar things. And so basically what I want to put forward is, is that why would you deny a museum the same means of approving a collection that you yourself have employed? And finally, I just want to say, again, this is all brief, it's superficial, uh, and you need to consult with your tax advisor always. You know? And uh, as you make your plans, uh, work with the tax advisor, but also work with the curator. And between the two, the collaboration, you can achieve an optimal solution for the future of your collection and your personal legacy. And if anybody wants to dive a little deeper on it, there's a great book. It's published by the American Association of Museums. And it's titled To Give and to Receive, a Handbook on Gifts and Donations for Museums and Donors. Um, and so it's a useful tool that gets really down into the nitty gritty details. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm so honored to be here. Um, this is my first time at Cassetta, and I will definitely be here next year. I can't believe I've never been here before. Um, thank you to everyone and all the hospitality that I've been given to attend this conference. Um, I've learned so much, and I'm very honored to be on this panel with everyone as well, too. So, um, so I'm an art lawyer. Um, I try not to be a nasty lawyer. I'm one of those. I try to stay out of the courtroom and help people with their estates. Also um, help collectors with transactions, help artists with um, the sale of their work and protecting their work. Um, so again, I try not to be one of those scary lawyers. Um, when you're thinking about what you're gonna do with your collection, yes, there's the donation option to a museum. And you have to be careful on what kind of conditions, you know, like Sue mentioned, um, you know, maybe the museum just can't handle it, it's not something they're interested in, so what are some other options for your collection? I frequently get calls from um, heirs saying, I just inherited such and such and such. What do I do with it? And I'm like, well, I don't know. What do you, what do you want to do with it? There, we have some options here. Um, I can't sell your collection for you. That's not what I do. But I can help maybe connect you to someone or perhaps you know, help with the paperwork on that. But one of the things to consider is actually auction houses. And we have Heritage here as well who um, definitely hand, um, helps different collectors with this all the time, is thinking about, well, we can sort of plan what I want to happen to my collection after I pass. Um, they can inventory it for you, help you with appraisals, things like that, um, that you really need to take care of now, uh, because your heirs, it's going to be really difficult for them to handle that after the fact. So um, that's sort of one route to think of. And if you're going to go the auction route, um, meet with them and learn more about what you're agreeing to with them. Um, learn about uh, you know, what sort of terms, what's the split going to be um, on any sales, and uh, is there ability to get out of the contract as well, too. Um, if there's going to be an issue with provenance and in your work or something comes up in the title, um, the auction house is likely going to pull that lot, right? They don't want to be involved in that liability. Uh, so. Those are sort of some legal concerns, um, you know, making sure you have proper appraisals, um, provenance, and sort of what kind of profits um, you're going to be looking at on that, um, on those sales. Um, most people want to donate to a museum, right, because it's very, it's, you know, very glorious, right? It's like, that's the ultimate. My collection's in a museum. But your collection might work better in educational institutions as well, too. Um, many universities accept um, collections of particular artists, students that went there. It's very important to them. Um, you could look at uh, other nonprofits, art-related nonprofits, that may be able to benefit from your collection as well. Um, you still get a tax donation, right? The same, or tax deduction like you would with a museum, uh, you know, and, and help other nonprofits out. Um, if you're going to go a different route um, with not donating to a museum, but perhaps another nonprofit or university, you want to make sure they have the ability to sustain your collection. Um, keep it, you know, protect it, make sure they can do the proper maintenance, make sure they have the proper storage, proper insurance as well if any damage were to occur. Um, so these are kind of questions when you're um, considering donating to, you know, someone other than a museum. What, you know, what, what do they have in place to make sure your collection's protected? Um, uh, we earlier talked about exhibitions and loans as well as sort of a way to clear out that collection. 
give you some more wall space. Uh, when you look at those agreements, though, you should always be given an, a loan agreement, right, on who, that's going to state where your work is going, how it's going to be treated, who's involved with shipping, who's paying for shipping, who's involved with the insurance all along the way. So um, artwork is created and moved by, and touched by a lot of hands um, in creating an exhibition. So damage happens more often than not. So you want to make sure all those um, legal issues are in place. And if there is something that happens to your collection, are you protected? Are you indemnified? Is there a, a specific clause in this loan agreement that says, you know, if any damage occurs, it's on the person with the artwork. It's their responsibility to pay for all of that, any repair that needs to be done. Um, another thing to kind of think of, too, is storage. Um, so there you can be sort of um, savvy in how you store. Um, has anyone here heard of free ports before? Um, many of you know, these are sort of tax-free duty zones where you can store your artwork, also transact artwork tax-free. So a lot of, um, there's one in Delaware, um, Geneva is the most famous, they sort of started this concept. Uh, um, and there's all kinds of things in these free ports, I mean there's, um, and things that, you know, gold, different collectibles, all kinds of things that are sort of being traded and sold inside these storage units that are highly secured. Um, it's kind of like walking into like, I don't know, CIA or you know, some kind of James Bond facility or something. It's crazy what they've gotten there. But um, a lot of artwork is stored there and sometimes never actually even surfaces because they continue, collectors continue to sell to one another. And they have even have like gallery setups in there where you walk in and it's, um, you know, it's like you're, you're in an art gallery, but you have tax benefits there, right? You're not, you're avoiding, you know, taxes on these, um, you know, capital gains tax on these properties. But um, that's sort of another option as well, too, um, to sort of think about what you could store it at any storage facility, but maybe there's some benefit in storing a free port from a financial perspective. Um, so something I always mention um, to my clients regarding estate planning in their collections um, are the differences between a will and trust. So um, mo hopefully most of you have heard of the differences between that. A will is the more traditional route for your estate plan, but um, it actually is a, a, a ticket to, to the courthouse. You typically have to go to a probate court to handle the passage of your estate. Um, but if you are smart and go through a trust, there may be ways to set things up from a tax perspective um, to avoid um, some estate planning taxes and other things. And it's also more private. Um, sort of you kind of put title of all your assets and, and your artwork in this trust. And, and then upon your passage, it, whatever the trust document says, that's where things start being transferred. And you have an executor that'll help with that, and you typically have an attorney who knows how to handle um, these types of estates and art. Uh, and it allows the privacy of your collection to remain as well. Um, but it, it will avoid, you know, hopefully legal battles and things like that, and how do you transfer title um, and, and all that. Um, so I always recommend a trust if you, um, you know, go see, seek an estate planning attorney to help you with that. It's definitely not you can set, something you can set up on your own. Um, so with, um, I guess I'm pretty much through the most of what I was going to discuss. I got two minutes, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, I actually, I'll end, our, I'll end early here. So we have more time for, Mr. Lewis, for Ted, and we have more time for questions as well, too. So. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna work all this equipment. I do not have my 12-year-old grandson with me. So, so uh, uh, anyway, if there's a technological uh, failure, it's the, um, the, the results of that situation. Well, um, um, my wife and I are uh, collectors of Southwestern material. Um, a huge part of the collection we have, is that better? Okay. 
A huge part of the collection uh, we have, of course, focuses on uh, Texas art because that, in effect, is where we, uh, where we started. So what I'm going to um, uh, discuss with you here um, is about three things, uh, beginning with uh, why we collect it all, and then how we make decisions on art to add to the collection, or in some cases do not make decisions, we just add to the collection, uh, and then a bit about how uh, we refine the collection, and uh, the third point would, uh, would deal with deaccession. The comments on deaccession, we have all heard some uh, very good uh, comments from the, uh, from the previous speaker here. So, uh, uh, speakers. So one of the uh, challenges I have is how to condense uh, 35 years of, uh, of uh, collecting and refinement and deaccession into 10 minutes. So um, I've been told I'll, I'll get skinned alive if I go over the, uh, the 10 minutes uh, here. So I'll, um, I'll start a bit with um, uh, why we collect it all, and, and that's a question I've been asked many times. And I think when, uh, when we begin collecting, we really didn't give or pay that much attention to a question like that. But I think as we move through the process and begin to analyze it, it really began with a situation of interest. And uh, what, uh, what we were interested in. And I think that most collections, uh, certainly private collections, when people analyze things like that, uh, it goes back to they're either interested in a specific geographical area, they're interested in specific artists, uh, they're uh, interested in just having pretty things on their, uh, on their wall. In our particular case, with the Borderland collection, uh, it became reflective of the places that we've lived or where we've had homes and those places have been primarily in the Southwest. Uh, we've lived in California for a period of time, we have a home in New Mexico and here in Texas, and in a previous life, I traveled to Mexico uh, on many occasions for business and got interested in Mexican art. So we kind of have a confluence, if you will, of the borderland area and uh, in the US, the borderland states and relative to uh, Mexico, uh, primarily the northern states of Tamaulipas, uh, Leon, and, and places like that. So the, uh, once we decided to form a collection uh, that, that kind of reflected the general areas where uh, we've lived and operated in, uh, then we begin to refine it a little more. We started with Texas art, and, um, and we still do collect uh, Texas art, although not at the level we, we once did. But the art, uh, in our particular case, has to relate to the borderlands in some way or it has to relate uh, to American art. And uh, uh, that's where my wife has a little more of an interest. And she has uh, some uh, paintings from uh, uh, Marslin, Hartley, and Max Weber, and, and people like that. Put my uh, cheaters on here a little bit. Um, and one of the situations that we analyze is, you know, what we get out of the collecting process. And I think all of the collectors in, in this room or people in art uh, do understand that a huge amount of that is the journey. It's the people you meet along the way, the education you get. Um, 
and those general experiences. And I had um, mentioned to you that um, uh, we got involved in, in the borderlands uh, and collecting primarily through Texas but, um, uh, and Texas art. That began to expand in our particular case to three dimensional art. And we started to add things like American Indian pottery, um, um, uh, ranching uh, items from spurs to saddles and things like that. Uh, I'm in a little bit of difficulty because I filled the house up with 35 saddles. And if you, <laughs> and we don't have any horses, so, you know. <laughs> So uh, people think on occasion, uh, like a friend of mine, um, that kind of dovetails into this particular topic. I was in New Mexico uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about this same subject, deaccession. And uh, this individual uh, was and is a great collector. Uh, had the finest Western art gallery in America, and he turns to me and he says, you know, Ted, people think I'm crazy. I says, well, that makes two of us, and he meant that from the uh, assortment of artifacts that he had, which were thousands uh, with it. So, um, you know, I kind of pass that on as a, a little story about uh, the journey and, and some of the interesting people uh, you meet in, in this business, and you really meet interesting people in the Texas art business. Um, and there are a few of those uh, characters here in, in the room. Um, the, the other thing we've done with the collection we have, and if uh, uh, whoever's coming by tonight will see some of this, we've added um, a lot of art that, were, uh, that was done um, by uh, females or women artists, whether it's pottery, whether it's beadwork, or whether it's uh, Texas uh, paintings there. So we've tried to diversify uh, in that area, and we're actually lending some of those. We're talking about museum lending uh, to the Blanton, and they're picking up, I think, 40 items next week for an exhibit there. But we've tried to uh, diversify it with uh, Native American artists, women artists, uh, cowboy artists, Texas artists, and things that are um, reflective of uh, where we live and operate. Specifically with Texas art, the approach we took was a bit of, of what we considered to be a holistic approach. And what I mean by that is we focused on early Texas art, but we focused on early Texas art from a regional perspective. So we wanted the collection to include art that was representative of the Panhandle, El Paso, Houston, the Hill Country, uh, Dallas, uh, with the Dallas Nine. So we also tried to um, make the collection reflective of the uh, various uh, geographical and cultural areas of the state. Relative to uh, refining the collection, um, that's a challenge for any collector. Uh, occasionally, we have sold pieces um, uh, through private treaty, and I will just directly tell you, I regret every piece we've ever sold. So, <laughs> and we have probably sold 20, uh, 25 of them. Uh, we got in a, in a situation where uh, we had a company based in Austin here, and we had like 20,000 square feet of space in the uh, office, so we had additional space there, and uh, then we had a, a little um, a lake home that we had additional space in. Well, lo and behold, we sold 
the company and uh, we didn't have room to accommodate 20,000 square feet of art in the house. Uh, so we have sold things and we've used various um, um, sources to, um, uh, to sell that art from private treaty to auction. We have not sold any recently. Uh, it was about 10 years ago that the company closed down and uh, we had a, um, uh, a space problem. Uh, although we have added um, an addition to the home that, uh, that does house some of the, uh, some of the artifacts there. But in, in the refinement of the collection, we've tried to use a few principles that are the same principles we used in developing our collection is that we had about five categories and we would look at individual pieces and begin with what we felt the significance of the piece was. And uh, so, um, so I don't wanna say rarity, although that's part of it, but significance also went into our uh, decision, but it was significance to our particular collection. In other words, if we had a, a piece that we felt the artist had painted somewhat the same uh, uh, scene, you know, 20 other times, then we would probably look at, uh, at, at deaccessioning that piece. So we looked at uh, significance and influence we looked at rarity, we looked at eye appeal uh, with the piece, and um, we didn't focus, uh, as we did in purchasing it, too much on the economic value of the, of the piece. We, we have never gone about our collecting solely for the purpose of economic value. We've tried not to do crazy things, and on occasion we have done crazy things, but uh, we've tried to buy pieces that, um, uh, that we thoroughly enjoy. Relative to the um, ultimate distribution of the, of the collection, um, we kind of view it almost as if you're watering your lawn. You don't want to take a hose out and do the whole thing. You want to open up uh, various sprinklers. So uh, we're considering some private treaty sales. Uh, we're considering some, um, some institutions uh, with it. Uh, we're considering uh, whether we would want to put a trust together. Uh, and various things that the previous speakers have uh, spoken to and, uh, and addressed. But the important thing, um, if you have uh, you know, children or descendants, is to get them involved in the process. And we feel people typically you know, use the nice term, if we get hit by a bus tomorrow, what happens to the, uh, to the collection? It simply means when we croak, what happens to it? So we, we have brought uh, the children in and they're very much in tune with the various options that um, uh, were commented upon here. So um, I hope that uh, that bit of, uh, of rambling um, uh, at least gives you some perspective on the way that we went about things and uh, you know, Okay, we through. I'm off. Thank you very much. Um, Ted, can you hear me from across the table? All right. Yes. Okay. Um, one thing you you somewhat implied, but when we talked on the phone, um, you felt pretty strongly about um, that you don't have storage facilities. You obviously could afford to to have a storage facility and store more things and instead of having 12,000 you could have 24,000. But what, just speak a little bit to your thought about storing your collection and be sure you put the microphone to your lips. 
Well, in, um, in our particular, is this connecting okay? In our particular case, um, I should add one of the other decisions that we made is that we did not want to purchase things that we could not display and enjoy. So um, in, the, uh, in the process of, of that, uh, we had we'd been taking many, many trips for 30 some years to Santa Fe, New Mexico. So we, um, uh, after uh, selling one of the ranches we had in, in Texas, we had purchased a home up there. And uh, so through these additional um, um, facilities, primarily homes in our case, uh, we display a lot of art, like primarily our American Indian collection uh, is in Santa Fe and um, most of the uh, New Mexican art is up there. Well, lo and behold, uh, we filled the house fairly quickly so we're in the process of uh, renovating an old adobe grocery store up there uh, as another facility that would uh, double as a casita for the uh, family. And uh, uh, relative to that, this is off subject, but be very careful about buying anything in the historical district of Santa Fe and dealing with the city and the historical committee. First of all, they do not talk to each other. So uh, anyway, so we're, we're, well, we're well along on that twice the, twice the time. But to get back to uh, Bonnie's ori original question, um, is that we have purchased these other facilities that are used and utilized by family and friends to store some of the uh, art and artifacts short term. And then I'm going to ask you one uh, follow-up to that before Sue and Andrea comment um, related to the future of your collection. Um, you assured me that you do not want there to be a Sharon and Ted Lusher art museum. That's not in your plan. Um, you, d you didn't collect it for those sorts of reasons either. So. Uh, since you seem to know it will be distributed in different ways, and you talked about the possibility of gifting some to museums, um, tell me a little bit about what you said, because I think you were thinking of maybe making some restrictions on um, gifts that you might give to a museum, not the whole collection, but parts of collections to different places. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, what we heard previously is that um, and I think it's, it's almost a fact now, a lot of the museums are just bursting at the seams. Uh, so they're not actively, in many cases, looking or desiring to take in uh, large collections. So um, uh, we understand that, and from our perspective, uh, what we've elected to do, if anything is donated, uh, or, or given to a particular museum, we want to be assured that the material stays on display in the museum and uh, unlike UT uh, keeping the Frank Ray paintings in the basement, uh, if they're doing that to Frank Ray, no telling what they do to us. So, so, so the main criteria would be, would this be useful? And if it would not be useful, then what the family, uh, for various reasons, didn't take, which uh, they only have room for a small portion of this, would be distributed in different ways. Either uh, we would prefer it to sell, we would prefer to sell the material to people who would have a usage for it and would take care of it, and are. Um, uh, somewhat sharing our same views, like we would not be interested in uh, uh, selling a nice Texas painting to uh, uh, a tech guy who uh, lived in Silicon Valley and had just bought a coonskin cap at the Alamo and now wanted a painting. <laughs> so uh, so we, we would try and, from a general perspective, uh, gear it in that direction. Thank you. 
Um, I think we would all uh, be more than willing to help you if you want to just give well, all of us something tonight well, when we that, visit. That, uh, we, that we could, has we could, been we could clear out a lot to me before, and uh, one of the suggestions I had is that people viewing the home just pick out something you want and leave with it. That will reduce the burden of inventory. So. Uh, we haven't come to a conclusion on that and probably will not tonight. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll uh, return the U-Haul trailer that I had <laughs> purchased for the evening. Um, I know we're already out of time, but let me just do a couple of things. First, I promised Scott, who thought of this great idea, that he would get to ask a question. So Scott, stand up and scream your question. It's a very silly question, but I want to know the first Texas artwork that you bought, and did you know at the time you were going to be addicted to it? Um, well, I can, uh, yes and no. Uh, the first piece of Texas uh, art that we bought, because um, I was interested in, in ranching, was a uh, uh, Porfirio Salinas ranch scene. And uh, that was the first piece. And uh, then after that, relative to Texas art, we just started moving in various directions. Uh, we bought some additional Salinas pieces, but then we started to move geographically all over uh, from the Dallas Nine to people in El Paso and the Panhandle, Dallas, et cetera. I hope that answer. I hope that answers it a little bit. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Andrea a, a question. Um, are you, you still mic? Um, or the other one go? Anyway. Okay. Um, given what you've heard and maybe had a little bit more chance to think about, um, as Ted was speaking, as an art uh, lawyer. What, what do you see come up the most with your um, private collector, you know, clients that come to you maybe with a pickle and they've gotten themselves into, into something that they don't know quite what to do? Is there something more typical that we should all be aware of? Um, I think one of the most important things I keep hearing from Ted, which is really um, what comes up most often, is the inheritance aspect and not getting your kids involved. Um, not, you know, it, it's a very sensitive subject. No one wants to think about their death and, and what's going to happen, but you really need to have it organized for your family and have your family understand what's supposed to happen because what comes across my desk mostly are all the disputes after and not knowing what to do. A lot of um, children and grandchildren will inherit a, a very unique collection and not know where it should go. Um, I was on the phone the other day with a gentleman that inherited a collection of maps um, from his grandfather. He had no interest in maps. He had no idea what to do with them. He doesn't know um, the value of them or anything or who could help him. Um, so having that discussion early on with the children and grandchildren and other family members is really important. Um, the other legal issue that crosses my desk a lot is provenance. Um, not keeping your documentation when you purchase something, not making sure making sure you get that certificate of authenticity, you have that paper trail. Um, something, you know, you can inherit something from, uh, you know, a distant relative, and then when you try to go and sell it or you try to go to give it to an institution, all that paperwork's missing. And it's like, well, I inherited it for some, but did, where's the paperwork or whether they got it from? And uh, there's different ways to research that. Museums can help that. Auction houses have a way. There's all kinds of art consultants that can help that, help you determine, you know, do you have clear title? Just like when you buy a house, you have to have clear title, right? Same for art. Uh, but it can also be expensive trying to do that research after the fact because, you know, a lot of people may not be around. It may have been purchased from a gallery that's not there anymore. Uh, so those are kind of the two big issues. Uh, it's sort of, you've got to be proactive now with your collection um, to make sure that your legacy is passed down easily uh, to the rest of your family or um, to whatever institution you want it to go to. Thank you. Um, Sue, so I'm going to give you a chance to say some final thoughts. Uh, you've You've heard what we've all been hearing. 
what, what do you want to add as a final word of wisdom? Oh, okay. Well, I think in terms of um, flexibility for museums, if you're giving to them something that I skipped over earlier because I was trying to stay within the bounds of my time limit. Uh, but it may be, you know, your work is better than what we have in a situation, and it means we'll probably end up deaccessioning what we have, so yours will replace it. But let's say if you gave something to us that eventually we have a better example of. And I, I want you to know that it's not as if your, your legacy or your generosity drops off the map, because if we were to deaccession it and sell it, your name will always travel with that money, and to the next thing that is acquired under Texas Art, will have your name on it. So um, yes, it's not the same work, but I want you to know that it's not as if your legacy drops off the map altogether. Um, and we too are trying to build a really great collection um, at the museum. And yeah, I think that's one flexibility. Thing. Yeah, the flexibility is really important because you know we have individuals that sometimes either found foundations and they lend works of art and if I don't have them on view they'll snatch them and take them away but if they're all really concentrated in one area it means that I cannot put other things on view that also should be on view other master works uh, and so right now I have two works by uh, same artist five years apart different foundations they both have the same requirement and so I'm going to being in a situation of having to have both on display at the same time. And so those, in that sense, and when I have galleries that are already crowded, that I don't have enough space for you know, a lot of areas, you know, that really creates bottlenecks and things. So, I, and I know this is for the DMA now, we are really doing a, a major sort of um, strategic planning where we're really closely examining, doing surveys of space, uh, possible expansion plans, and we're discussing the needs of all these various areas, and I've already done a collection plan, what needs to be done, Texas Art is in there, and how we need more space for that as well. Um, and so we're all evaluating and how things are gonna shake out in the end, um, you know, remains to be seen, but it's probably gonna be a huge capital campaign. But it's just, just to know that space, and it's not just storage, it's in the galleries too. Um, and so, you know, those are, you know, we have some of the same issues that collectors do, actually, you know. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you would love to ask questions, but we're really out of time. Um, we're going to do the award ceremony, a couple of questions. Um, and I, I will say that I was not a, familiar with this book to give it to receive that Sue talked about, and we're going to get this um, through Cassetta uh, out to you all, so you have access, not the book, but how to, how to acquire the book. It sounds like a really good reference material for all of us. Um, and so I've been told the award ceremony will continue to be postponed for two more questions. So stand up and speak loudly. Uh, Bonnie, um, I'm a collector. I'm not a discipline collector. I'm kind of a get um, And I've inherited the uh, works as well. I have a problem. Um, and on my Texas art collection, I, I have decided where I'm going to, uh, I don't have children's art, but I have decided where they're going to go um, and to museums. And um, i decided, uh, I've also warned my family, my greatest fear is that there's going to be an estate sale and they won't know what's going on and, and, and you know, that's terrifying to me. So I'm, I'm, I make sure the family knows this, this piece goes here, and I put it on the back of each piece. This goes to this museum and working with curators and working with um, tax attorney and that sort of stuff. But I do have a problem. I, I inherited my mother. We grew up in the Panhandle, and um, she was very good about commissioning local artists to paint portraits of the family. They weren't particularly famous artists, but they were good professional artists. And um, I don't know what to do with these portraits. Who cares about a portrait of Francine Carraro from 1960?
well, it's basically what to do with her portraitures, uh, at the portraits. Family and portraits. Family portraits. And I have to say, that's a really tough one. And I don't know that I can give you much advice uh, on that one, because uh, we have portraits that are in the basement that pretty much have remained there. To me, it's just like the exception for a portrait is if it's breaking some new bounds, if it's really, really unusual and really striking. Um, but if it's just the usual dead white male, you know, uh, in a suit, an old tie, you know, just, it, it's not going to make it out in view. Yeah, you're on your own, Francine. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, everyone, I, I have, I saw two more hands at the same time, and one's on this side and one's on this side. All of these people, although Ted, I think you'll only be able to catch him tonight, because Sharon has told him he has to rush right home um, to help for tonight. But you, you go ahead and ask a question. Uh, I guess it's a question for Ted or anybody on the panel there. Uh, some of the best museums I've ever been to are private museums, and unfortunately there are not as many private museums as we hope there would be. Uh, what's your main objective um, to creating a private museum, and um, why don't more people do it? I mean, you have such a wonderful collection, and instead of dispersing it to different, lots of different things, you know, to actually create a, a, a private museum and a foundation to keep their legacy and, and the collection together. Will you repeat the question? Just hold it. Um, well, in, um, in our particular, particular case, uh, we are giving some consideration to that. The challenge with a private museum, um, depending on um, location, size, large town, small town, is that there is a tremendous ongoing cost with these. Um, much more, and a lot of people, a lot of people we have known do not uh, really think that through. It's more than uh, buying a building, uh, putting your art in the building, and hiring a couple of people to run it. It is a tremendous financial in endeavor, and the museum people here can probably speak to this, Many, many museums do not make any money at all. They're total losses the way uh, that they're run. Also, Texas has um, a significant amount of museums already. So one of the considerations uh, that we have in, in doing something like this is uh, if we did this, how do we add incremental value, uh, whether it's knowledge, information, or whatever it, it may be? And uh, uh, in, in our particular case, one conclusion, if we were to try and go ahead and take this path, would be that there's, uh, there are some but there's very few museums in Texas that are reflective of the entire borderland area. You know, a lot of them, if you mentioned a California painting, you'd get thrown out. So that, that is uh, one possibility with it, but our concern, quite frankly, is the ongoing expense the expertise that it gets to do that, uh, that it takes to do that, and, in our, and, and also whether the other family members are willing to sustain it after we make the, if we made a decision to do that, uh, because often they have an interest, but they typically do not have the same interest as the people who created the collection. That's a, uh, a long answer, but uh, uh, those are things that we have wrestled with in that area. Ted, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take one last question. I saw one over here. Yeah, it's me. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I thought it was your friend. I, I, I usurped her. Um, <laughs> this is for all three of you about donating of collections and or individual objects and the care and feeding of those objects down the road, that's frequently not considered in museums. And I'm talking about conservation and preservation monies. 
they go with it. So that's all for you. Well, from the perspective museum, uh, it's a rare thing that people will often give works of art and um, and preferably they've worked with the, the, the curators so they know that what they're giving is definitely what the museum really wants. But very few people really think about the care and feeding in the future, um, you know, funds towards basically ensuring the physical integrity of those objects throughout time. Um, so, you know, funds for something like that would be something that would be extremely helpful, um, but that is really extremely rare. Yeah, um, just to add more on that, um, like inch as well when you were discussing, oh, sorry, <laughs> when you were discussing um, uh, creating your own museum as well, um, the insurance costs too, and the security costs. And the insurance is something that's not just you're done once, you have to constantly be getting new appraisals done and have, um, you know, and adjusting the policy and things like that. Um, you know, it, it, it is just, you know, there's a lot of more costs you think that, oh, my, you know, my work is in a museum, this is glamorous, this is great, but um, underneath that, there's a lot of staff to make that happen. Um, and it's just, and the costs just can increase uh, over time. So um, I think that would be very thoughtful if you were going to donate to an institution, also consider donating funds to keep, um, help keep your collection there and help them with those costs to, to store and maintain your work. Ted, I don't know if you've thought about that, you know, when you're, talk when you're thinking about giving sections of your collection to different places, um, if, if you've thought about it, giving them an endowment as well? Um, we, have, uh, we have thought about it, <clears throat> and uh, presently we have come to the conclusion that uh, for us as a family that is not a practical thing to do for many of the reasons that have been previously discussed here. And, um, you know, we have a number of friends in the museum business, so we're aware firsthand of the many, many issues in caring for the material. Uh, also, uh, just the material in our home, um, yes, there's an expense to it, but there's also an ongoing effort. Somebody has to haul this painting in to get re-cleaned, you know, with it. Uh, the frame is uh, cracking on it. It needs a new frame. Uh, they need continuous maintenance, the proper dusting and, and care. And um, uh, these are all major, major things that um, uh, that are challenges to someone like us. Uh, obviously, all things being equal, we would prefer to keep the entire collection uh, together. Uh, whether that's practical or not, uh, I don't know. And at, at, at this particular point in our time, we would say it's probably not practical for us to do. Uh, we're, uh, we're still e examining the, uh, the situation. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to stop it there. Um, you can track down um, Sue and Andrea at the conference to ask them specific questions and Ted tonight at his lovely home. Thank you so much, everyone.